speak about the privilege of even speaking that language and to engage in those signifiers. Um, Hannah Arendt, uh, the revolutionary uh, ref refugee and 20th century political theorist story and work as a homeless philosopher may be used as a case study for challenging and confirming some of the, the Kant's claims with regards to love. Namely, uh, that analysis is essential. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I wanted to put my sunglasses on because Anne was really cool yesterday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be like her. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, Hannah Arendt's love affair with uh, Martin Heidegger and his metaphysics of being in the world as dot sign uh, put her on a path of engaging in her own form of lifelong self analysis through the writing of the autobiography of Rahel Barnhagen, who is here on the right. Uh, Rahel Barnhagen was a, uh, the, sorry, I'm going to start with uh, some dream analysis of, that Hannah Arendt does of Rahel Barnhagen. Um, she was uh, a, a 18th century uh, Jewess. Um, who uh, had a Berlin, famous, infamous Berlin salon, um, where she perpetuated the, the goods occult. And so this, almost like my picture, this, this serves as a mirror for Hannah Arendt, and if love is a mirror like we've talked about in this conference, then this is, uh, this is her mirror in a lot of ways. Um, in the biography, uh, Hannah Arendt informs the readers that Rahel had a reoccurring dream for 10 years. After two heartbreaking relationships for Rahel, her nights had been filled with a consuming, hopeless yearning. Unhappiness vanished from the day, the rent writes, flees into the night where rage is unchecked, even though it cannot affect the day. The dream only occurred to Rahel when she was not involved in the miracle of a simultaneous reaching of love, as uh, Lacan describes. Our rent writes that in the dream, Rahel finds herself in an, in in an inhabited palace with a magnificent garden, a fair-sized terrace with linden and chestnut trees of equal height, with various walks, ponds, tree-lined paths, and the usual purposes of gardens. The room was well lit with a large number of servants and hosted the most distinguished per persons. However, even though Rahel knows she belongs to those distinguished persons, she can only see their backs. She was prevented from joining them by a form of paralysis. However, each time she appeared in the room, she always appeared a few rooms away from the people. There appeared an animal of the size of a sheep, half goat, with a, with a sort of angora pelt, pinkish snout like the purest, most delightful marble. She says that the animal was an acquaintance. She did not know why, but it loved her tremendously and knew how to tell her and show her that it did. She had to treat it like a human being. So, it was, it was in the fall of 1924 when the affair blossomed between the, the then 18-year-old philosophy student and the then married 35-year-old professor Martin Heidegger. In the Kant Seminar 8 on transference, the Kant uses the template of Plato's Symposium to explore the themes of love. The relationship between Heidegger and Arendt mirrors that of the love in the analytic context as explored by the Kant. Heidegger plays the role of Socrates. Hannah Arendt plays, young Hannah plays the part of Alcibiades, and by 1958, um, she comes to ex exemplify Diodemus' Prince, um, philosophy in the text of what she calls Amor Mundi, the love of the world. And maybe that's a contentious issue that Wayne brought up, so <laughs> I'm interested in what he has to say about that, the love of the world. But anyways. So uh, what Lacan refers to as the miracle of love, the simultaneous reaching out toward an object, ignited between Arendt and Heidegger, uh, for, for Arendt in particular reached a level of intoxication, which can be compared to Alcibiades. Her desire had been incited on a demonic level. Um, I'm borrowing that from Rollo Ra May's uh, Love and Will, um, and, and, and where he also talks about the symposium. But uh, a demonic level, as she referred to Heidegger in her later years as her first amour, in the symposium, Diodema likens love to a daemon. Lacan, through this logic, suggests that Alcibiades is the daemon of Socrates. The love between Arendt and Heidegger that developed can be seen as this daemonic love. Heidegger even wrote to Arendt on the 27th of November, 1925, that the demonic has struck him. 
Arendt had also developed what she called in her poem, uh, The Shadow, an unbending devotion to a single one. In the 1958 Human Condition, her uh, magnum opus, Arendt right, like, uh, would liken the daemon to a shadow, or the subjective who, what others can see but not yourself. Hannah Arendt appears in this case as the daemon of Martin Heidegger. Um, so the love relationship was uh, life-changing for Hannah Arendt. Um, similarly, Lacan was very much influenced by Heidegger, and, and, I, and I was interested in this notion of the Alcalma, which seems to also be a, a word for what Heidegger and Heidegger's metaphysics is the enigma, which is capital B being. Heidegger writes that the essence of metaphysics consists in the fact that it is the history of the secret of the promise of capital B being itself. Capital B being itself is an enigma. Being is the agalma. Uh, similar to Heidegger's position with regards to his metaphysics, Lacan notes that the analyzand is automatically placed in the position of the beloved. The analyzand, by speaking, demands to be found lovable. Think notes how analysts like Socrates ask a myriad of questions of the analyzand, questions to which he often has no answers or only a confused one. By asking questions of the analyzand, the analyst comes to highlight the lack in the analyzand, who then comes to believe the analyst must have the answers. This is precisely the position Heidegger would assume in association with the rent as the subject is supposed to know about the enigma, which is the objet de tita. So, uh, following the affair in a rent, um, uh, it was, a, at least from Elizabeth Young Gruel's uh, biography, it was a this was a huge deal for Hannah Arendt. She had to leave Heidegger. She left uh, to go study with Carl Jaspers in 1926, where she wrote her dissertation, Love and St. Augustine. So love was on her mind immediately at the end of this affair, and I think that has to do with her object with uh, Utah. She, she explores Heideggerian metaphysics, weaving them into different notions of love, such as caritas and cupididas. Um, and, and, and right directly following, uh, her, uh, this, uh, her dissertation, she writes uh, the, the autobiography. Auto, I put auto in, in, in the quotations because it's, it's, it's almost as if she, it's her biography. Um, so, it's a very helpful not good. Uh, she wrote, excuse me, so she had a lot in common with this uh, prominent Salonier in the late and late, early 18th century Germany. They were both Jewesses, but not only from the desires, but from society itself. Many years later, Ren would even say that Bart Hagen was my closest friend, though she had been dead for some 100 years. On the 27th of February, 1933, the burning of the Reichstag occurred. Hannah Arendt had finished the first 11 chapters of the book before fleeing Germany and Wynne finished the final two until 1938, under the pressure from Benjamin and Blucher, her husband, who would, who would become her husband. The manuscript grew with the rent as she would revise it in later years. It was willed to power as our, a becoming being, a manuscript in exile. Thirty years passed before the manuscript was published in 1958, the same year as her magnum opus, The Human Condition. And I'm suggesting that this writing that grew with her was a form of psychoanalysis through autobiography. Um, she presents a critique by not directly engaging with psychoanalysis. And if anyone who's read Hannah Arendt's work and is looking for psychoanalysis, they'll notice that it's just not there. She purposely ignores Freud and has this, and it's because of her, uh, she, she thought that Heidegger was the most important thinker of the 20th century. Uh, so she's much more influenced by him than she would be Freud. Uh, evidence of this assertion that I'm making is that she, uh, she writes at the beginning in the preface of this book uh, that this is an angle, unusual one in bio, biographical literature. She says she deliberately avoided the modern forms of indiscretion in which the writer attempts to penetrate the subject's tricks and aspires to know more than the subject knew about himself or was willing to reveal what I would call the pseudoscientific apparatuses of death psychology, psychoanalysis, and that the book was never intended to be about Ray Hill's personality which might lend itself to the psychological standards and categories that the author introduces from the outside. Arendt concerns herself with Rahel's life as she herself might have told it. This suggests that Arendt is taking a subjective position as Arendt merges with Rahel. The subject and the object become one within the 
autobiographical narrative. The, the piece becomes a form of self-analysis. She engages with the big other, maintaining to her, to, to her theories about the public and private. Um, and it's also a, a very Heideggerian critique in the sense that it's about the eternal recurrence as the will to power. Rahel Varnhagen presents the eternally recurring narrative of her own subjectivity. In the human condition, our RN writes that the philosophy of life that does not arrive as did Nietzsche at the affirmation of eternal recurrence as the highest principle of all being simply does not know what it's talking about. So in the book, uh, basically, she has a very similar affair that uh, Rahel Varnhagen has a very similar affair to the, 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 high, the, the affair that Heidegger has with, our, uh, with Arendt. Um, the dream that I talked about earlier came to the first time uh, after, uh, which was a recurring dream for, for Rahel for 10 years. It came to, the, to her the first time um, after the end of a, a relationship with gen, the genteel Count Karl von Finkenstein. It was Rahel's first real romantic relationship. She's noted it as saying that Finkenstein was le premier qui a voulu que je l'aime. The relationship would last four years, the same amount of time as Arendt and Heidegger's. Love for Rahel wasn't giving, was giving what she didn't have. She was the lover because of her unworldliness. Her love for him was much more devoted because of the chanciness of the whole possibility of it happening. No privilege was going to give her anything. She had to rely on chance alone. Whereas Finkenstein, attracted by his own lack, did not seek the same things in the relationship. The, the more he learned of her, the less he liked as the novelty of the alien world wore off. The end of the relationship with Finkenstein left Farm Hagen with awareness of nothing other than her own object of Tita. Arendt writes that when he chanced upon her, fell in love with her, with her in particular, and in doing so made her a specific person. By making her a specific person through the recognition of love, he had incited her own dignity to and feelings of home of the palace. Heidegger, as in the dream, gave her rent what she didn't have, a home, just like Finkenstein. So to conclude, um, in, in, the, in the book of Laughter and Forgetting, Milan Kundera writes the struggle of man against power is the struggle of, against memory against forgetting. With the writing of Rahel Van Hagen, uh, Hannah Arendt offers an interesting critique on psychoanalysis. Arendt had created her own signifiers for the world through the life of Rahel Van Hagen, maybe through a form of Santone, I would say, as uh, you're talking about, while simultaneously engaging in signifiers for the world through the life of, uh, while simultaneously engaging in a public action because the archives are in the real, and uh, I, I think this is a form of archival materialism, um, for, through subversive writing, an attempt in a time where Jewish memories were being erased um, from the planet. This action of Arendt can be seen as a recreation of herself and her ability to live with her own objectivity, leading to individuality as a conscious pariah as part of new. Uh, Arendt writes of Rahel that she learned that love can guarantee the whole of human life only occasionally, that such love came only as an unpredictable stroke of fortune, and even then could, only, could do so only if it transformed itself and ceased to be the richness of alien worlds. As a conscious pariah, Arendt had come to a greater understanding of love and her relationship with the world, despite the massive traumas she suffered in love and war speak to this. Love for Arendt wasn't just about desire, in a, in a letter to Heinrich Lucker, whom, to whom she would stay married for 30 years until she was widowed, they both agreed that loyalty was the greatest virtue of love. In the human condition, Arendt states that love is the only thing that can go against the predictability of a totalizing technocratic system. It is an action rather than a reaction. The power of forgiveness is the opposite of vengeance, while the power of promises breaks the demonic aspects of the world from oblivion. Thank you and beautiful desire. Thank <laughs> you.